Please help me give a warm welcome to Francesca Cavallo. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So uh, tell us about yourself and how the idea of this book came along. Um, well, we always uh, say that this book came from a place of uh, anger. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, Elena uh, and I, uh, moved from Italy to Silicon Valley in 2012 to start our children's media company called uh, Timbuktu Labs. And we did the whole drill. Uh, we uh, looked for investors, we launched uh, a better version of our um, magazine, uh, which was called Timbuktu Magazine, and we got accepted into 500 startups, and we, we raised a first seed round of capital, and then the moment came where we needed to access more funding to scale the company. And um, um, that, that was a, a very telling moment in our personal story as professionals because we started seeing consistently um, the same kind of feedback that, uh, and, and I'm reporting literal comments that we received when doing fundraising, that two girls alone <laughs> could not uh, pull it off, that this was a nice uh, lifestyle pro uh, you know, project, but it wasn't going to be a big, a big thing, uh, that uh, people in any case were only interested in buying Disney content, that they would never buy our content. And the feedback that we got was consistently geared towards um, telling us, uh, we don't, you know, we, we don't think what, what you're onto is, is particularly interesting, but um, if you did a platform for user-generated content, um, then maybe we, sh we could revisit the conversation. And we were explaining that user-generated content was not particularly awesome. Look where it, it led us. <laughs> but, and, and, and that was not uh, our main asset as founders, that we were very good at creating outstanding content, even with limited resources. But mm, the, the conversation wasn't, wasn't going anywhere. And that when you receive the same feedback over and over and over again, you start questioning, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right and I don't have what it takes. Uh, my vision is not going to happen. And uh, so, uh, but there was something that in, in, the, in the form this feedback was given to us that didn't convince us that it was coming from a good place. So we said, okay, let's leave. Silicon Valley uh, here. This is probably not the right place for us at this time. Let's give it. A, let's give Los Angeles a shot. We, we didn't want to leave California. We really love it. Uh, we really loved California, but we wanted to try again. <laughs> we had, at that point we had developed 12 mo mobile apps, and um, but we had reached the point where we needed either more capital or we needed to shut it down. And um, we moved to Los Angeles, and for one year we went into freezing mode. We, it was just uh, Ellen and myself. We didn't have any other employees anymore. We rented a small uh, one-bedroom apartment here in Venice. We worked out of our kitchen, and uh, I wrote horror stories for um, a company that was doing uh, text-based fiction. <laughs> and uh, we did some consulting work. And we got to the point where uh, we had uh, $8,000 in our bank account. And uh, we said, okay, we had this idea of a newsletter for uh, parents who wanted to discuss positive female role models with their kids at the dinner table. And uh, the subtitle of the newsletter was uh, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Uh, we started, we had a, an email list by that point of a few thousand um, uh, users from the apps, but we wanted to start it from scratch because we wanted it to be very focused on people that were passionate about female empowerment. Not parenting in general, not apps and education, just female empowerment. So we started from scratch from a newsletter of 25 people, selected from our friends, from those friends who we felt uh, we had a connection with uh, on that theme. And this newsletter started growing. Uh, we, um, 
you know, we, we did a couple of things to, to uh, attract even more people to sign up, but mostly it was growing because people were uh, forwarding it to each other. And we got to the point where we got about uh, 4,000 subscribers. I like to speak about numbers, be actual numbers, because when you don't say the numbers, you can think, uh, oh, they already had so many subscribers, or when they launched, they had probably 100,000. No, when we launched the Kickstarter campaign, we had 4,000 subscribers. And we said, at one point, we said, okay, we think this newsletter could become a book. And uh, this is how the book should be. So we put together a Google Doc <laughs> with a Gumroad <laughs> link at the end, explaining what the book would be about, uh, and it was just text, like a book proposal, but instead of sending it to a publisher, we sent it to the subscribers of our newsletter. And 5% uh, of that list gave us money, based on a Google Doc. G they gave us $35 each. So we were like, maybe we're onto something, because this is a, a pretty ugly Google Doc. <laughs> <laughs> so if 5% of people are converting, uh, then maybe we're onto something. And maybe we, we had been looking at the uh, crowdfunding space for a while because we, had, we were interested in, uh, in um, uh, giving the finger to the investors who had said no. <laughs> <laughs> and that seemed like a pretty cool way to do it. So we had been studying the platform a little bit. And uh, when this idea came about, we were like, this could be the perfect idea for Kickstarter. So we put together the campaign, and because it was just the two of us, we basically had to put together a domino of things that needed to happen the moment that we hit the launch button on Kickstarter. So we, um, did, we did all the things that we could. Uh, we used... Uh, boomerang to you know send the emails to all the the journalists that we had selected the day of the launch we i remember that the the, the day of the launch we had uh, a schedule and uh, that was starting at 5 a.m and it was divided in slots of uh, uh, 15 minutes each and uh, we and so we had all of these actions that we had to do in order to pretend that we, there was a team behind this yeah. thing, a big team. And um, so we launched the campaign and um, we raised uh, for, with a uh, funding goal of $40,000, which we raised in the first uh, 30 hours. Wow. And uh, at the end of the campaign, after 29 days, uh, the book had raised uh, $675,000 from uh, 13,000 backers from 75 countries. <laughs> becoming the most crowdfunded uh, publishing project in history. And we record which uh, held until Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls 2 came about. <laughs> <laughs> and then, when we launched Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls 2, we raised uh, $100,000, uh, which was the funding goal in the first three hours. <laughs> So, and that was, uh, you know, uh, this was the, it, it was our, we had developed before this book um, 12 mobile apps, and we had published six uh, picture books before this. So, just so you know what an overnight success this was. <laughs> That's an, that's an amazing story. I'm going to sneak in a personal story. I had met Francesca at a party right before they were launching the Kickstarter campaign. And I remember receiving a personal email from her or a Facebook message or something like that, like just uh, uh, soliciting the Kickstarter funding. And it seems like so well organized to me. And, you know, so happy to hear that it was such a great success. <laughs> um, in fact, these books are, are a great success. Uh, the issues are not new, though. I mean, you know, female empowerment and kind of highlighting the story of uh, women who did great things is, you know, something that could have been done long ago. And, but this book is really successful. And what is this book doing differently with respect to the previous, not too many, but there were previous attempt of telling story of an important woman? Yeah. Um, yes. First of all, the, as you were rightly saying, there are not so many books that tackle specifically nonfiction. 
So there are a few books uh, with female protagonists in the fiction world, but uh, there, there's not so many nonfiction tackling these uh, issues, especially for this target. And um, so this is uh, for sure one factor. And um, if, you know, when, when we started working on this book, I was um, uh, so sad when I thought about, I, you know, I, I thought, we, we, Ellen and I thought about our childhood and about the books that we liked as children. Um, and we realized that none of them had a female protagonist. And not just that, that throughout uh, elementary school and then middle school and then high school and then college, I, I did, um, throughout high school, for example, I didn't study a single female writer. In his, if you look at history and we think about uh, female figures in history, they're mainly, or in historical movies, they're mainly nurses, they're, you know, catering to the needs of the men who are making history. And uh, we felt so outraged by that notion and we wondered um, what would be, like, what we would, would we be if we had started the women who had made history? Um, is it possible that we would have been more confident when facing so many no's uh, and uh, that we would, we would have uh, second guessed ourselves uh, ourselves less? Um, would it be possible that we um, wouldn't have taken so much time to understand that the problem wasn't us, but it was the people that were giving us feedback? Um, and we thought that if you bring this personal issue on a global scale, th that becomes incredibly powerful. And that learning the story of women that before, real women, that before us have made history could be incredibly powerful. So uh, part of it was this, uh, we, when we got started with Timbuktu, uh, we, our very first product was Timbuktu Magazine, which was a news magazine for kids. So we've always had this passion for exposing kids to what's happening around them in the real world in a new way, in a way that could spark their imagination. And this project has always been political for us. Um, we, we've always thought that people like to think and to say that kids are the citizens of the future, and we've always looked at kids as the citizens of the present. You can't consider a person a citizen when they turn uh, 18 and they start to vote, and then expect that all of a sudden they are passionate about the world that's around them, and uh, they are involved and engaged in their community. You have to start early because, and you have to, um, do all you can to make them passionate about what is happening around them and not push them towards these worlds of fantasy that are beautiful and important, but it's not the only thing that's there. Uh, reality is fascinating and the impact that your daily work can have in real life is one of the most, I mean, one of the things that make life worth living. So we wanted, I, I think this is, um, what we wanted to convey through this book. So even though uh, there are other anthologies of uh, notable women in history, there have been many more after our book, um, there is um, a glue that keeps these stories, that holds these stories together, uh, which is this um, you know, uh, very deep desire of, of, of having an impact in the world and having uh, a set of values uh, that's, you know, this, this, this glue that, that is around these stories that holds it together that I, I think uh, gets to the, um, to the kids and to their parents in a way that is more powerful than other, than other books. Cool. Uh, well, one other thing that I appreciate a lot about the book is the direct style. It's not over dramatizing, it's not, but is also not shying away to showcase even some figures that were controversial. One that, for example, hit me because it kind of reminded of my childhood was Margaret Thatcher, a very controversial figure. Still, it, she's fe uh, featured in the book. Um, and I love that there was a quote uh, from each woman on each story. Was this a result of some stylistic journey or did it just come that way? Or what was the journey that brought you there? Um. 
there is this uh, very interesting piece of uh, data. Um, in Italy, uh, where I'm from, if you hadn't guessed, um, <laughs> only 3% of the streets and, and uh, public squares are um, named after women. And of these 3%, 97% are saints. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> to be remembered uh, in, uh, in our country, um, you literally need to be a saint. So <laughs> one of the things that we didn't want to do when we wrote this book was to create a book of saints. Um, <laughs> because we don't, I mean, and aside from the religious aspect of it, we, there are um, no religious figures in the book. You can create a book of saints even if you adopt the liberal lens, right? Uh, you can say, a woman needs to be perfect by my standards in order to be featured in this book. And of course, my standards are not universal. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we featured um, a variety of women and that we did not shy away from uh, featuring women who were controversial and who had been controversials, controversial during their life. Because one of the uh, most uh, dangerous lessons that uh, we as women are taught uh, is that we always need to be likable. And that is one of the biggest detriment to develop leadership skills when you are uh, a girl and also when you grow up. If you are a good leader, you have to accept that at times you will not be likable. You will not be liked. And if you are not able to deal with that, you are not going to be, you're going to be a shitty leader. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, simply the truth, because you are there because you are making difficult choices that other people would not be able to make in your place. If you're not able to go through that path, that is just not going to happen. So we really care to feature uh, also figures that, I mean, I, I personally and politically, I'm not aligned at all with Margaret Thatcher. But still, she was one of the most influential uh, figures in politics in Europe in her time. And uh, she came from a family, uh, her father was a butcher. So in the highly, uh, uh, you know, difficult system, class system that Great Britain has, she was able to become prime minister, which is a quite impressive feat that needed to be celebrated. Um, and we needed, we, the way we thought about these stories is also that each story uh, celebrates um, particularly one trait. And in her case, her story was very, was the most, uh, um, iconic story to celebrate a, a woman that was able to be controversial to follow what she thought was uh, right. Cool. So you're, you started mentioning like how do you select this, like the, the story. So I wanted to know a little bit more about that. You're saying that you're trying to celebrate each, one trait for each woman. Is yeah. That, what are the criteria? That there are a few criteria that we um, adopted. One of them was that we wanted every girl to find a piece of her story in the book. So we really cared from the very beginning to feature women from all over the world and from uh, different ages. Uh, and um, so that was, the book needed to um, reflect the diversity that women appear in the world. <laughs> uh, if you look at uh, cartoons, this is not novel. We've seen it on Facebook one million times. But uh, usually, uh, the way women are portrayed also in animation is much uh, narrower. It's much more narrow than the way male characters are portrayed. So uh, we are led from a very young age to believe that we, there is only one acceptable way of appear as a woman, which is certainly not the case because all of us are different in this room. So we wanted, um, and, and this is, um, you know, it, it was important for us to show that women are, can be very different from each other and very different from the um, characters that we see uh, normally on TV and on the big screen. And uh, another criteria was that we wanted to feature women from the past and from the present. We didn't want this to be just a history book that was just in the past, because um, it mattered to us that um, 
one of one of our goals was to help people see the rebel girls around them and um, um, to learn how to celebrate the women and the girls in their life and to learn that uh, incredible women are our sisters, they are our colleagues, they are our mentors, they are our teachers, our parents. Um, and um, it was very important to do that by mixing uh, past and present figures. And of course, we wanted to show women from the past to show that women have always been there. We haven't looked at them, we haven't celebrated them, we haven't recorded them in our history books, but they've always been there. And um, um, the other criteria was that we wanted to feature women from all sorts of, uh, with all sorts of careers uh, to show girls that they, that they can be anything, really. And um, we were very proud when um, uh, we, every day we received letters from our readers from all over the world. And a few months ago, we received this letter. Uh, they had a career day in elementary school. Uh, and um, this girl said that she wanted to be a surgeon when she grew up. And one of her classmates uh, said, you are a girl. You can't be a surgeon. And she didn't take offense. She was like, you didn't read the good night stories for Rebel Girls. Before. <laughs> Which is a reaction that I hoped I, I had had uh, during those meetings. It's like, you don't know you, what you're talking about. Don't waste my time. <laughs> That's an awesome story. So um, since you're touching to on the reaction of men or in general other gender, so uh, making it better for, for us women, for all the genders, uh, should not be all on the um, underrepresented gender. Um, how about titling the next book, uh, Good Night Stories for Boys and Girls About Rebel gir Girls? That would be a, <laughs> an awful title. I don't think it would sell anything. <laughs> um, of course, there is a provocation in calling yeah. the book Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, and it's intentional. And, um, but growing up, I am I'm sure all of us have read plenty of books where we were not in the title. We were even inside the book. So isn't it ironic that a lot, I mean, this is a feedback that we receive uh, of people that are offended that boys are not in the title. Isn't it um, educational to be passionate about something when you're not in the title? <laughs> this is our point. We, when we are asked, uh, are you going to do a good night stories for rebel, girls, uh, for rebel boys? Uh, we say no, because this is the book for boys. It's very important to learn that you can not be the protagonist in a situation and still be involved and still be supportive. It's been from the beginning of history that we've been supportive of, east of stories where we were not protagonists. So we're not asking for the moon. And this is one book. Right. Insert curse word in the middle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so about good night nice stories about rebel girls. <laughs> it's not, a, but th that's not, it, this book is not just about rebel girls. Mm -hmm. This book is about uh, courage, is about, uh, is, it's, it's about life. Mm -hmm. It's not just about girls. As women, we've been, you know, uh, Female writers have always struggled with this, and we still do. When men write a book about a love story, they are writing about love and about life and about. When a woman writes about a love story, they are writing about a, their own personal experience, and they are writing something that's very niche and very. This is nonsense. I mean, why are we considering, why are we denying women the possibility to reflect and to make <laughs> assumptions about what life is also for men? We've lived all our life with men making assumptions of what life is for women. So why, this, it, it's quite time we start uh, talking about the issues that we care about, whether they are part of our daily life or whether it's stuff that we're th simply thinking about without having to justify ourselves and uh, you know, to, to hold off because what if boys get offended? Mm. Honestly, who cares?
Right. <laughs> uh, so the yeah. The question wasn't wasn't too much about boys getting offended, but about making sure that actually boys would read it. Like, uh, it, it it it's a big step to uh, to convince somebody that this is a book also for boys, which I completely agree with. So, what is the path that we have to take to make sure that we have this allyship with the other gender? And what is the path that we have to take to make sure that boys actually do read the book? Well, first of all, many, uh, I want to um, say that many boys are already reading this book. Cool. So there are so many par parents around the world that are buying this book for their, uh, also when they just have boys. Uh, and they love it. Because this is more of a thing that grown-ups think that they are not going to be uh, into it because uh, it's called Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Right. But actually, this is a book of great stories. So when they are exposed to it, uh, they just love the stories just as much as we loved the stories uh, when we grew up. Um, so that, that's a very important thing. Um, there is something that happened to me uh, last year. I have a friend who is very passionate about gender equality and uh, she had a, a daughter. And so we, uh, when, when I bought clothes for, uh, for daughter, I shopped in the uh, boy aisle as much as I did in the uh, girl aisle. And um, two years, uh, no, one year ago, she had, a, she had a boy. So there I was again shopping for her son. And I'm ashamed to say I couldn't bring myself to shop for a boy from the girl's high aisle. This is a problem because it means that as much as I, am, I like to think that I'm awake to these issues, I, I still have so much internalized misogyny that I felt it would diminish the value of, of her boy if I shopped for him in the, female, in the girl's aisle. This is the problem that we're talking about when we are afraid of buying a book like this for boys. Right. And there is no easy solution. We need to realize that this is the world that we grew up in and that this is part of what we think when we think about ourselves and when we think about our daughters. And we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. It, it's going to be uncomfortable because this is, I mean, Oppression and the patriarchy is so deep, it runs so deep in our veins that it, it's going to be uncomfortable to get over uh, all these automatic assumptions that we make and all these automatic choices that we make every day. But it's, this is the battle of our time. And we, are, we need to, be, to hold ourselves responsible and to uh, have the courage to do what's uncomfortable because freedom is at stake. Cool. Um, thank you. Uh, if you would have had a book like this to read when you were uh, a child, how do you think it would have changed your life? I hope uh, it would have made me shop in the girl aisle <laughs> <laughs> without thinking about it. <laughs> That's good. Um, you, This book is it's, it's amazing, it's been translated in so many languages, so there's demand for it in, in the entire world. Um, it, it is, is it just the result of demand or you had a vision behind this? Did you want to translate it in all the language up front or did you get requests for it? How did that happen? Well, it's not like you want to translate something in 45 languages, a book, and you do it. <laughs> right, right, but of course. So. <laughs> Um, we, to be honest, uh, in our wildest dreams, that are pretty wild, I, I can assure you, <laughs> we would have never imagined to have uh, the, 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 between the both of, of them, uh, we sold almost three million copies worldwide to date. So, we would have never imagined that the book was uh, going to, um, be so successful. And uh, the thought of families around the world ending their day uh, 
reading these stories in so many different uh, languages really uh, moves me. Uh, it's something that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's so powerful um, that I, you know, we, we, could have never, we could have never imagined something like this. Cool. Um, so you, you, told one, you told us one story about uh, a girl who had read your book. Um, do you have any other interesting stories? I'm sure people reach out to you all the time. Yeah, yes, uh, they do. And it's uh, interesting how the um, range of people that are reading this book is so wide. Another uh, letter that really hit, hit me was uh, from a, a guy, um, I think he was in his 20s, and uh, he was uh, in a, going through rehab uh, after uh, he was um, an heroin addict going through rehab. Uh, rehab, and he told us that he had found strength in these stories, uh, in that path. So this is, it, it was very moving for us because it's like our readers are giving us that, um, that feedback that these are not just stories about girls because otherwise it wouldn't happen that so many people around the world are, are identifying with these people. And, but one thing um, matters about the fact that these are all women, that um, telling their stories uh, enables us to speak about things that have not been spoken about before. When you are in the line of work that you're you know, a writer and that you work on stories, many people like to say that all stories have been told already. And this couldn't be farther from the truth because there are so many of our stories that haven't been told yet. We haven't heard any of it. And stories are so important in shaping a person's identity. We, when we think about our life, we tell ourselves the story of our life through, we, we, made, we, we make it into stories. We divide it, we create uh, causes and effects and uh, consequences, and uh, we identify pivotal moments. But that's just, I mean, it's not like life, it's like that. Life can be also seen as a, you know, as a chain of random events. And then it's us, we put order in those stories. And the fact that women have been deprived by the possibility of being exposed to the stories of other women with similar experiences means that the story that we are telling ourselves about our life is lacking. <laughs> we have a lot of holes that we don't know how to fill yet and that be, have been filled with the perspective that men have on our stories, even if they don't have a clue of what it's like to go through this world as a woman. So we hope that these stories help mm -hmm. girls fill up those holes with a perspective that is, that is their own, so that it, empowering people, more people, to own the story of their life and is empowering them to choose what their future is going to be like. And this is you know, the, the reason why we, we are so passionate about telling these stories and uncovering new stories and uh, um, tapping into the huge community of readers that we now have and uh, asking them to help us find new stories because we can't possibly think that we can access uh, all the relevant stories in the world just by virtue of being us. Cool. Um. I wanted to open two questions from the uh, public, if there are any. That's our microphone, and it's... I have a question. Hi. Thanks for coming today. It's been really great hearing you talk. Um, my question for you is, um, you mentioned that you include in your book women from the present, which is really important, as you pointed out. Um, when you write about them, like how do you figure out which women to choose, and um, do you are you planning on a volume three and accepting submissions for, not me, but <laughs> I mean obviously Marcia, but no, are, <laughs> um, I, I know a lot of great women that you know would deserve to be potentially called out in in this kind of story. Um, how do you find the people? It's a, a, a mix of uh, historic and journalistic research, and also we receive a constant 
uh, influx of names. <laughs> and what we do is uh, we, write that down, uh, we write them down and then we go through this list and we research them and we start you know, putting them, uh, the ones that uh, seem to have uh, uh, stories that we are drawn towards. We drag them to the top of the list, and then we start again, and then we start again. It's a long process. Research, we always start from research uh, when uh, working on our books. And um, we end up uh, at some point with a list of roughly 150 women that we've uh, compiled uh, uh, quite an extensive research about. And then we work, we try to balance the book so that it has uh, you know, enough diversity and enough, um, and also that um, we look for stories that can uh, allow us to touch upon themes that maybe have not emerged in other stories, or that allow us to talk about uh, professions that we haven't talk ab talked about uh, yet in, other, in the other books or in, in other stories. And uh, little by little, the book starts to appear. <laughs> so do you have to um, send the copies to the people that you're writing about since they're like actually alive and could we object. don't have to um <laughs> but we like to yeah <laughs> uh, because uh of course part of the part of our work is to all the people working on the book the researcher uh of course us the writers uh the editors the illustrators uh we are all women and we like to um, reach out to the women that we write about uh, because this is also a way to connect with each other. We connect with the artists and the artists connect with each other. And uh, so we, we like to, from the very beginning, we, um, we've seen this book as a platform to um, elevate women's talent. Uh, and um, we're very proud of the fact that, that um, something uh, weird happened after the first book. Um, some people started to write uh, to us to tell us, uh, well, I discovered the, the amazing story of this woman in your book. And of course, in many cases, the story that they were talking about was actually in the book. But uh, there were also a lot of cases where they were telling us, I discovered the story of this woman in, this, in your book. And we were like, I don't think we wrote about this one. <laughs> So at the beginning, we were quite confused. But then what happened was that basically the book was like giving people the ability to see stories that they didn't see before, to see talent in people where they didn't look for talent before. And this is incredibly powerful. And uh, we're very, very proud about that. So when um, people write to us with names, we always take note, because that's uh, part of the miracle that is happening uh, around, uh, around this book. Uh, thanks for coming and giving this presentation. It's really great to hear directly from you. Um, my question is, are you working on book number three? <laughs> we are. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but we also launched a podcast uh, which has the same title as the book. And uh, in that case, uh, it's, um, each episode is, a, is a, an extended version of one of the stories uh, contained in, in book one or book two. And uh, we asked um, different women to read um, the, the, the episodes of the podcast. We had uh, Purna Jagannathan from The Night Off. We had uh, Melinda Gates. Uh, today, we released Frida Kahlo, read by Pamela Adlon of Better Things. Um, you, um, we had Alison Mosser, the singer of The Kills. And in that case, uh, we asked ourself, uh, ourselves, what is going to be the equivalent of the illustrations in an audio production? And it was voice, of course. So it was very um, important for us to use the podcast as a platform to elevate women's voices because we are not used to the female voice. And uh, the, when we look at uh, the impact that this has uh, on the general population during elections, for example, that is very, you know, it's uh, very um, annoying and dangerous. 
So in that case, it's been very important for us to feature a variety of women's voice, of female voices uh, that tell these stories. And um, we're very, very proud that, of that too. So if you haven't checked, if you haven't listened to it, uh, check it out. <laughs> so my question is sort of following up on that. You've done two books, you have another in the work, you're doing the audio books. What, what's next? Um, is it all just um, female empowerment and rebel girls? Is there some other area that you're going to try to shine some light on and bring attention to? Are there other media that you're- Female empowerment is a large enough issue for my <laughs> lifespan. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I grew up uh, as a um, liberal woman uh, in, uh, in Italy, as I mentioned, and I always read uh, liberal newspapers. And uh, at one point I realized that I had spent my, you know, all my 20s thinking that um, all the important problems were like in the, uh, you know, economy and healthcare and, uh, and then when all of those important problems would be solved, we could possibly tackle women's rights. And for a very long time, I thought that was true. And I was like, how could I be so blind? How can I consider this a second, you know, uh, a, 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 an issue of, of secondary importance? So I think it's very um, important that we own the fact that this is a central part and that we do not vote for people who consider this <laughs> like a, an afterthought. We are half of the world. So if half of the world is being held back, that is a pretty big problem for this uh, community <laughs> that we are part of. Imagine what amazing things will be accomplished when half of the world will cease to be held, held back. I just want to add to that, um, that at Google, we struggle with this all the time because um, there's a, obviously a lower percentage. It's not 50% of the, of the engineers at Google that are female. Um, that's not even close. I think it's more like 20%. Um, and that's something that people in Google take very seriously and they're always trying to change that. Um, and the way they try to change that is by making sure that we are open to hiring um, women when we're interviewing. But we're not hiring the, them just because they're women, we're hiring them because they're able women. But the problem is that the pool of women that they come from is, is also small because the number of women who were graduated from college with a degree that would help them in computer science later on is a small percentage as well. So the problem comes earlier in life, and, and this is what I've argued with people for a long time. You can't just increase the percentage of women in engineering at Google without fixing the problem before that, without fixing it before they even get to college, without fixing it when they're children, when they're young and they're, and they're um, trying to figure out what it is that I want to do when I grow up. And this is a perfect solution to that because this is, I never had this problem growing up. I have three older sisters and a mom who are all very, very strong-willed <laughs> and difficult people. Um, and, <laughs> um, and so I, you know, when I wanted to go into computers, it was n there was never any question. But I think for a lot of girls, there is a question. They're like, I don't know, is that too masculine? Is that something that like maybe I shouldn't be doing because no guy will be attracted to me because now I'm a nerd? I mean, um, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. And, and it's nice to see that you're addressing that sort of issue across all these STEM fields, I imagine. Not just, not just STEM, but anything, right? Like even literature and... Yeah, and it's also a matter, I don't uh, believe necessarily in the way we describe um, what a scientist is. So I think that a lot of girls are very passionate about science, but it's just that the way we look at science, we don't consider their um, way of thinking scientific unless it meets certain stereotypes that we have in our heads. And that is a way to discourage um, girls from uh, pursuing scientific careers. In other words, I don't, I'm not 
I don't necessarily buy that we need to uh, just um, reskin male scientist characters with uh, f you know female bodies, and that is going to solve the problem. Which I well in the um, in children's media I see a lot of that. I think it's more of a matter of reframing what having a scientific mind is. I'm sure um, uh, you all have experiences. Well, I don't have a husband, but uh, what I, I have the experience of my mother and my father, and my mom is way more scientific than my dad in uh, tackling uh, problems of everyday life. But it's just that we are not used to recognize a certain structure in the way of solving problems unless it's applied to computers as a having a scientific mind. So for example, one of the stories that uh, I was, uh, we met some of the um, women that we featured in, in our books. And uh, last uh, spring we were on tour in the UK and we met um, Merit Moore, who is in the second book and she's uh, a professional ballerina and uh, a quantum physicist. If you think about that, normally we, tend, especially in the United States, to, to encourage people to choose one field and one field only and to become the expert of whatever uh, field you picked. In her case, she fought because she loved to dance and she was like, I understand physics better when I dance. So she, you know, that's the kind of thing that can help us attract <laughs> more women. Because and it's not like attracting women to the STEM fields as if the STEM fields were a, a, a place that was made for men. And it's more redefining what we think about uh, science and what we think uh, when we think about having a scientific mind. That is, I think, solving the problem uh, at the very uh, root. Thank you so much. Um, so now that you're talking about this, have you ever thought about, because you're a great storyteller and you reframe things so that people, normal people, right, could also see themselves in the shoes of, you know, a great scientist or that isn't in the exact field it's supposed to be in, have you thought about creating like a template so that a mom or an aunt or a, you know, the everyday life mom that maybe won't be able to be captured in this amazing book because you're looking for bigger role models, perhaps, um, so that they can do it on their day-to-day, -day too, so that like, their children can be inspired. So I don't know, something like a, a quick framework so that, y a template, perhaps, so that they can, you know, because I, I, so I have a daughter. It was, the joke was, I have a daughter and two boys, but my two boys are two and four years old, and my daughter's six, so I'm overcompensating on girl books. And so my kids, my boys are like, I don't know anything else. <laughs> it's really funny. I'm like, they don't even know that it's like, the other way around in the real world. Um, but I was wondering if there's any chance at all that you would think of creating something so that our sons or, or, or even girls can, um, can see their moms reflected there too. To you mean a platform story. for user-generated content? I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> without having to put it on somewhere, but at least for them to tell their own stories too in a way that makes sense, because I think it's the, the framework that is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. For them to bring it to life in a way that makes sense for them. I'm not. Um, particularly drawn towards, um, you know, um, platforms. Sure. Mm, so I, I understand that. I mean, you work at Google, so that's you know, the way you you. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, you 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 I want to templatize it. things. <laughs> And I chose a line of work where I can stay away from templates as much as possible. <laughs> so I, I would hope that um, uh, reading these stories uh, would, uh, will inspire uh, kids when they see their moms going to work. Uh, to, because one thing that I, that I cannot stand when I see movies, and whenever you see working moms, it's always like, their kids are uh, neglected and they are, you know, I, I hate that. Mm -hmm. And um, so part of the reason why we wanted to celebrate the work of women in the book is um, that we, we wanted to offer kids a framework to read the work of their mothers with, with a different set of expectations. And um, 
there, there was something very touching that happened during one of our presentations in Milan. Um, we were in this uh, bookstore and it was uh, filled to the brim with people. And so they, we let the kids come and sit in the front so that they could see. So immediately before the beginning of the presentation, one of them uh, um, opened the book on the page of uh, the first page, uh, which is uh, Ada Lovelace. And uh, he turned to the, to the audience and he said, my mom did this. He was the son of the illustrator who created this portrait. Nice. And to see him standing so proud of his mother's work in front of all of, of that people, all, all of the, the people, was uh, you know very meaningful. Thank you. Anybody else? Any more? Thank you very much. Um, I um, relate to a lot of, um, you know, this stories in my way and uh, really love it. And actually, I get these books and give it to any f female friend of mine that has a daughter now as just a present. <laughs> I think it's the best present that they can get. Um, but also, as someone that I'm in science and um, you know, just climbing up the ladder and trying very hard. I always wonder, uh, who is the rebel? Am I a rebel, um, like, or am I normal? You know, like, do we want our girls to think of themselves um, eventually to that they're, this is the normal, this to be um, equal to men and to be um, getting the same education, the same opportunity. Um, is the no should be the norm, and we are working toward that to make it normalized, not not um, giving it a name. For example, um, we na we tend to name girls uh, bossy if they are just um, you know a good leader, or they want to be a leader, or they're working on that. Or we call even um, people feminist when we actual feminism is really believe in equality of men and women. And uh, in nothing, no other category, we name people that are just believe in equality a name. That's just, to me, is like, well, isn't it the ideal world that we want to be normal? Like the normal it means to be, uh, to be equal and every part of the society get a, its fair share of uh, success and progress. So in, because you are working on this, and this is such a valuable and um, progressive work, and every day you probably meet so many people and so many ideas rush to you and so on, do you see like in the future um, that this work kind of moves toward introducing like the um, uh, education and women in STEM as normal and not rebel? Like, do you think that, do you, do you know what I'm? Yeah, 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 sure. Like, have, you, have you touched that idea? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And uh, of course, we are um, doing all this work so that in the future, people will take this book and be like, why rebel? <laughs> right? The point is that we're not there yet. And that for so many women around the world, being rebels is not a matter of, you know, it's not something they can choose or it's not a matter of having their uh, tongue pierced or <laughs> it's a matter of survival. Because we have so many expectations and such subtle and uh, uh, but not subtle, but so many, so much, so many strong invisible laws around us that need, we need to be rebels in order to um, survive in many cases and to thrive in most cases. Um, we need to be rebels to leave uh, an abusive relationship. We need to be rebels uh, to um, choose to go to school when the Taliban uh, try to close the school for, for us. And uh, if you look at, the, at this from a global perspective, this is uh, rebellion is very much needed. And um, when you think about um, rebel boys, it's like 
in the image that forms in your mind is just a very dynamic um, kind of person, a, a young man. When you think about rebel girls, at least up until our book came about, usually rebel girls don't end up well. You can, the image that you can, that forms in your head when you think of a rebel girl is the image of a, uh, a woman that does not have a bright future ahead of her. And uh, we wanted to change that because to defy society's expectations is the first step to uh, gain a freedom that everyone tries, not everyone, but most people try to deny us every step of the way. I want to thank, thank you very much, Francesca, for being here with, this, with us today and for being so inspiring with your stories and with your books. Thanks again. Thank you.